When I was working on my undergraduate degree at the University of Minnesota, my macroeconomics professor was Walter W. Heller. Professor Heller was sort of famous. He'd been President John F. Kennedy's chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, and after Kennedy's assassination, he continued in the same post for President Lyndon Baines Johnson until he had a disagreement with President Johnson over raising taxes to finance the Vietnam War. This was at a time when it looked like inflation would begin to overheat the economy. Had Johnson listened to Professor Heller, the inflation of the 1970s might have been avoided. You see, Heller was a Keynesian economist and very attuned to the role that the government could play in keeping the economy growing and on an even keel. Professor Heller was nearing the end of his career when I met him. He retired just a few years after I graduated. His course was rigorous and he was a demanding teacher. But he was also a very nice man. At least he was nice to a young undergraduate like me who asked questions that when I look back on them were not very sophisticated. Professor Heller possessed a great command of the economic theories of John Maynard Keynes, which in the heady days of the 1960s were all the rage. Leaders and policymakers like Heller and JFK had little doubt that government intervention and Keynesian economics could correct the economic problems the country faced. Arguments between the Keynesians and the anti-Keynesians have persisted ever since and shape much of the macroeconomic debate even today. But it was in an article that Professor Heller wrote when I was a student that had the greatest influence on me becoming an economic historian. In 1980, Heller published a short essay entitled, Can There Be Another Crash? In it, he looked back at the Great Depression. In reviewing the causes of the Depression and comparing it with the economic situation of the late 1970s, he concluded that it was unlikely that a crash would ever happen again. So he was mostly wrong. And as a historian, I now cringe when scholars attempt to predict the future based on an appeal to historical events. But at the time, I was struck by the fact that Professor Heller was taking a historical perspective on the study of economics. That he was interested in looking to the past to explain how we've gotten to where we are today. And that is something that historians are very much interested in exploring. So I gravitated to history in my studies, and particularly to economic history. After graduating, I went to work in business for several years. I worked for a printing company. This was at a time when desktop publishing was taking off, and the printing industry, especially quick printing, was booming. But the age of electronic media was waiting just around the corner. I was afraid that the printing business might not be the best career choice for me. So I returned to school, this time for my doctorate. Since I had always been interested in economic history, and people like Walter Heller had shown me what a fascinating topic it could be, I chose that as my field. Actually, my greatest interest was in the early modern period, roughly from 1500 to 1800. I studied foreign merchant communities and world trade before industrialization. Toward the end of that period in history, an individual who would have a profound effect on how we think about the economy today and about economic history wrote a very long and very influential treatise that presented the way he thought the economy worked. The treatise was published in 1776, a watershed year. It was the year of the American independence, and it was the year that the Scottish Enlightenment thinker Adam Smith came to the public's attention as the author of the seminal work, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Smith's book outlined what he thought were the principles of economic behavior. He described an invisible hand that guided human behavior for the common good. Underlying his book, however, is the recurring theme of self-interest. Smith wrote, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Smith was not the only early thinker to write about how the economy works, but he's certainly the best known. Most people today, including most economists, think that Smith was identifying some of the universal truths or overarching laws about human economic behavior. 
One of Smith's universal laws was that man is basically a calculating, self-interested being. He implied that as individuals, we hold little regard for the community, and therefore that markets are mankind's best hope for channeling behaviors for the good of all society. This belief largely stemmed from assumptions that Smith and modern economists make about the way people behave. Indeed, many scholars suggest that free markets and other modern economic concepts already operated in the very distant past. Historians, on the other hand, question the value of posing universal laws of human behavior and question even their existence. For the economic historian, explanation is the overriding concern. Rather than tying ourselves to abstract laws or confining human nature to straitjackets of self-interest, Historians prefer to dig into the sources. We want to see how things work in practice in order to come to a better understanding of why people act the way they do. In a general sense, economic history concerns itself with the ways that mankind has structured his environment in the past in order to provide food, shelter, and clothing. In other words, we're interested in examining the process through which society provides for its material well-being. Now let's face it, this doesn't sound too terribly stimulating compared to some other historical topics like politics and power, glory and warfare, faith and ideology. At the same time, the basic economic worries of finding food and providing for one's welfare are so much part of human existence but economic history is the study of power, glory, and ideology. I'm reminded of the slogan, it's the economy, stupid, coined by President Clinton's presidential campaign advisor, James Carville, in the 1990s, when he tried to keep staffers on message. It would not be off mark to state quite boldly that the study of economic history is the study of human survival. The implication is that we will need to take account of all human characteristics and how these characteristics shape our behaviors. In economic history, we concern ourselves with the interplay between economic and social, political, and cultural behaviors. This makes studying economic history a pretty broad undertaking. Now, on the other hand, economic history is not the examination of the history of economics as an academic discipline. And we will only lightly touch on the history of economic thought. We will focus on what happened in the past rather than what people thought about what happened in the past. Even so, we can't ignore economic theories, but they'll play a very small role in our discussion of economic history. So what are the central concepts of economic history? Well, as with anything else, that depends on whom you ask. The late Nobel Prize winning economic historian Douglas North suggested that what is of particular concern to the economic historian is explaining the structure of the institutional structures that underlie and account for the performance of an economic system and how these institutions change over time. For economic historian Rondo Cameron, the most pressing concern was to explain the origins of unequal levels of development in the world. While we will touch on many of the concerns that Douglas North and Rondo Cameron raised, I think the charge that David Landis gave to economic historians is the most useful for this course. Landis was a professor of history at Harvard who wanted economic historians to trace and understand the main streams of economic advances and modernization. That is, how mankind came to where and what we are in the sense of making, getting, and spending. So we will need to ask some important questions if we're to understand these main streams of economic history. And these are questions that we can ask about the present as well as about the past. For example, first, what was produced? Even the most primitive societies had to grapple with this question. Primitive societies might think of it in terms of what they could hunt, what they would plant. When I was growing up, that was a question that my family asked each spring when it came time to plant our vegetable garden. And it's a question I ask my family even today when we plant our garden. And I will tell you that I keep planting turnips that nobody wants to eat simply because my dad always planted them. <laughs> 
But this is also a question that entrepreneurs have been asking for thousands of years, and startup tech firms still seek to answer. This very fundamental question, what will we produce? Two, how is it produced? This question forces us to look at resources like labor and machines in order to understand how goods were made in the past. Looking at the changes that were made to how things were produced helps us to understand how we got to where we are today. And it's a question that businesses also still ask, how will we produce it? And three, how did what was produced get distributed? This question can be asked of the family, of the community, and at the regional, national, and international levels. Thinking again about my dad's garden, the question was always how to get rid of or distribute the overabundance of zucchini squash we invariably were left with each summer. On a larger scale, asking this question helps us to understand commerce, the allocation of resources, and social welfare practices. Now, some of these seem to be pretty simple questions, and many economic historians have posed them over the years, but they're anything but easy to answer. They encompass a lot more than they might appear to. These three questions lead to discussions of prices, resource allocation, production methods, technological development, labor, supply and demand, and the list goes on. The questions also point to issues that economists and economic historians alike address, while doing so in very different ways. Economists, for instance, practice something that few historians are comfortable with doing. They look to the future and try to predict what will happen and could influence decision making. This is the kind of economist Walter Heller was until toward the end of his career, when he began to see the benefit of taking a historical perspective. Historians, and this includes economic historians, are oriented toward the past. So we don't try to predict the future, nor do we try to offer advice on how to fix the economy. Our attempts at influence, when they occur, tend to be more cautious. Historians and economists also approach questions from different methodological perspectives. Economists tend to try to isolate the so-called independent variable in order to identify regularities that might predict human behavior. But to us historians, again, including most economic historians, this notion of isolating variables is not attainable. Instead, we suggest that in attempting to explain what happened in the past, we need to consider as many variables as possible. Actually, most historians consider all variables to be interdependent. Removing any one of them alters the situation, so the explanation suffers. With that brief explanation about what economic history is, where do we go from here? Well, I aim to describe, and will try to explain, the long course of economic history since about the year 1400. Even so, I will have to set the stage leading up to 1400 to help us get our bearings. My goal is to show how we got to where we are today, and that's a pretty tall order. So if we were to list some of the highlights of the economic history of the past 500 or more years, what would we include? Think about that for a minute. The world has changed a lot in 500 years. Well, if we were to make our list in chronological order, we would probably include the development of productive agriculture. Mankind moved from hunter-gatherer to cultivator millennia ago, but only recently has agriculture been productive enough to allow people to focus our efforts on other activities. Agricultural surpluses created important changes for how mankind provides for itself. Second, the development of business contracts and agreements. Now, business contracts have existed for thousands of years, but the form these took changed over time, and hundreds of years ago gave rise to a variety of partnerships and corporate relationships. Third, the expansion of trade. Although the great European voyages of discovery come immediately to mind, Trade has expanded in a multitude of ways over the centuries. Local and regional trade has always been far more important to the economy and commerce in the rather mundane goods 
like food and tools and clothing, expanded just as much as global trade did. Fourth, the development of the idea of economic nationalism, or what Adam Smith would have called the mercantile system. We usually call this mercantilism today, although it isn't a perfect stand-in for my preferred term, economic nationalism. Fifth, the development of science and technology, and the routinization of knowledge. How does the development of science and technology relate to the economy? Well, it might be obvious today, but new ideas have long since radically affected how we produce things, and that addresses one of the central questions of economic history. Six, the shift to industrial production. As probably the greatest force in modern economic history, the transition that we refer to as the Industrial Revolution was not really as sudden an occurrence as the term revolution implies. But it completely changed how we produce, what we produce, and it changed how we distribute what we produce in significant ways. Seventh, population growth. Global population growth brought with it a demographic revolution and changes in our methods of production and resulting increases in agricultural productivity. Eight, free trade and mass consumption. These concepts became increasingly important in the newly industrial world. As factories spewed out ever larger quantities of products, industrialists strove to tear down barriers to trade and worked to get consumers to accept their mass-produced goods. Ninth, imperialism, colonization, and warfare. The forces of imperialism, colonization, and warfare touched most of the world's population and set up an enduring divide between the global haves and have-nots. The result was social tension and outright violence as the so-called rich societies sought to exploit the poorer. And finally, economic growth and development. The struggle between the haves and the have-nots led in more recent years to attempts to spread some of the wealth around the world. Programs intended to affect economic development and to help stimulate economies to grow inform much of our recent economic history. So we have quite a list, and even that's just a beginning. I intend to address each of these topics and much more in this course. One recurring theme that will thread its way through every one of these topics is the concept of capitalism. Now, what does that mean? How do we define capitalism? Well, some scholars point out that the term capitalism really refers to a social construct rather than an economic system. And capitalist can be a difficult concept to define. It is one of those terms that people often say they understand, yet have a hard time explaining. Frankly, there are many possible definitions of capitalism, and many of them are construed negatively. Defining capitalism is even harder when we try to apply the term to the past, to a very different set of circumstances and social and economic contexts from our own world. The word itself is rather new. Capital, basically meaning assets, dates as far back as the Middle Ages. But the word capitalism originated only in the middle of the 19th century in the context of referring to an economic system. And then it was usually used by socialists. Today, most people think of capitalism rather idealistically as a natural and timeless human condition. So let me try to define the term. And since I'm going to be the one drawing up the list, I will say that some characteristics of capitalism that we should include are clearly defined property rights, enforceable contracts, Markets that set prices, and institutions favorable to the above elements. This gives us a starting point. So capitalism could be defined as an economic system in which rational private property rights and enforceable contracts provide for the efficient functioning of markets that generate price signals and for which favorable institutions exist to create incentives for participation in the system. 
In this general statement, private property rights refers to the ownership, control, and exchange of a resource or a good. And enforceable contracts are to minimize costs and disputes. Now, I suppose this is quite a mouthful, and many scholars will nitpick parts of it. But that's capitalism in a nutshell. The problem is that this conceptualization represents more of an ideal as a way of thinking about the economy than it is a description of reality at any point in the past. It also does not describe economic relations during most of human history in most parts of the world. Aspects of it can be found in most historical periods, but rarely does the capitalist system seem to have been functioning fully the way I just described it. For example, in the Middle Ages, real property, which under my definition we would consider as a resource, could not be bought or sold the way it is today. If you could go back in time and ask a medieval peasant who owned the farm that he worked on, you might get a blank stare. That's because the idea of ownership was very different than it is today. So we will try to avoid grappling with capitalism as an abstract concept, except in passing in the lectures that follow, and instead focus on the markers of its development along the way. Another concept we will pay close attention to is the role of institutions in economic history. This is an even more difficult concept to describe than capitalism. At its core, the study of institutions, which I'll call the rules of the game for a moment to distinguish the term from the way it's used in the sense of an organization or an edifice, the study of institutions is the examination of the interaction between and among individuals, firms, states, social and legal norms, cultural practices, and so on. You will recognize that institutions change over time. The rules that govern much of human behavior, things like social and legal norms, for example, tend not to be fixed and constant. Rather, they can change dramatically. In turn, such changes can produce great confusion among historical actors when they're thrust into situations that put them into contact with new and unfamiliar institutional arrangements. For example, when parties from very different cultures come together to engage in trade, certain misunderstandings and miscues are likely to occur until each party adjusts to the new institutional arrangements. It is also true that when we look to the past, we attempt to interpret actions and attitudes of history into a contemporary institutional framework. We need to be careful not to assume that historical actors were operating under the same preconceived notions that we are. We need to develop a historical consciousness in order to make sense of the past. Now, scholars approach economic history from a number of different ideological as well as methodological perspectives. Let me present three ideological perspectives to offer a sense of the differences you will encounter in the subject and occasionally in, in my presentations. First is the neoclassical economics. In general, neoclassical economic historians apply economic theory to historical processes in the interests of understanding the past. This approach follows in the tradition of Adam Smith and holds in high regard the study of price theory, utility, and profit maximization, and the presence of rational economic actors. One drawback of neoclassical economics, as it applies to the distant past, is that it often struggles with the so-called free rider problem, which refers to those who benefit from something without paying for it. And it has difficulty accounting for cultural factors, such as religious beliefs, among other things, in human action. Second, Marxian economic history. Marxist thought has had a big impact on economic history and continues to do so to some degree even today. The basic focus of Marxian economic thought is the mode of production. The Marxist historian views every historical period as having its own identity, shaped by the ways in which the means of production are owned and by how people relate to one another in the process of production and by the material forces of production. 
In this view, all of the modes of production, meaning the institutions that govern production, have built-in contradictions that must be resolved through some kind of struggle. So to the Marxist, the driving force of human history is the struggle of one class with another. Third, world systems theory. While not a theory of economics per se, world systems analysis has had an important role to play in economic history. Rather than viewing the nation state as the most important focus of historical analysis, world systems theory seeks to substitute a regional or interregional approach. World systems theory also rejects the notion that Marxists and most neoclassicists alike commonly hold, which is that there is only a single path to economic development for most countries and regions. Now in this course, I have purposefully chosen to approach certain topics from perspectives such as these when it seems warranted. But in general, my approach is as much descriptive as it is explanatory. So again, where do we begin? This is a more difficult question than it might seem. We could start in the very distant past and examine the shift of men and women from hunting and gathering to their first attempts at cultivation. Or we might begin when people first started using coins to represent value. Or we might begin with the first long-distance commercial trade in the times of the ancient classical empires. But to understand the world we live in today, I think we must begin by focusing on Europe. Now, I admit that economic history has suffered from a significant amount of Eurocentrism. That refers to a point of view that is distinctly a European perspective. And you will notice a fair amount of Eurocentrism in some of the stories in history that follow. But this will not be to the exclusion of our voyages to other corners of the globe. And our focus, to the extent that it falls in Europe, reflects the fact that the world economy has, for so long, been so dominated by Western, meaning European, ideas and ideals. So it can be difficult to get past this rather parochial viewpoint, but we will. In the distant past, Europe's economy was rather insignificant compared to the economies of the great empires of Asia, like India and China. Still, in our modern world, the economic system and institutions that developed in Europe over the past 500 years or so are the ones that have taken hold. So if we're going to try to find out how the world economy got to the point where it is today, I think it makes sense to focus on Europe. And I think it makes the most sense to begin in medieval Europe sometime after the breakdown of the Roman Empire. I choose the end of the medieval period to begin discussing world economic history because life was not only very different from what even Adam Smith experienced, but people acted and thought in ways that were very different from what Smith described in his own time, not to mention what we experience in the world today. The French economic historian Fernand Braudel summed up this shift in thinking over the centuries when writing about vagrancy. He wrote, in the 16th century, the beggar or vagrant would be fed and cared for before he was sent away. In the 17th century, he had his head shaved. Later on, he was whipped. And the end of the century saw the last word in repression, he was turned into a convict. This was Europe. So it is in medieval Europe that we begin to see not only significant changes in the way people thought, but also the first baby steps toward what we might consider a more modern economy. Where will we end? Well, we will progress through several centuries of history and end, well, at the end, with a discussion of today's increasingly globalized world. My hope is that at the end, you will have a good understanding of the major currents of economic history.